Hi, my name is Kathy Collins, and I'll be co-hosting Airing Addiction with Lisa Blanchard. No one story is, is the same as someone else's, but each journey is different. Same thing on the table. Having run substance use treatment programs for over 20 years, trying to make sure that we are welcoming to I all. love the idea that kind of having that exposure and that affirming place, even for one person, impacts that milieu, which then can impact maybe the broader recovery community, the community at large. I mean, I really love that, um, that thought. My name is Katherine Collins. Welcome to another edition of Airing Addiction with myself and my co-host Lisa Blanchard. And it's our first two-part episode. So uh, welcome. We're excited about this. And I'll hand it over to Lisa, who will reintroduce our guest of the day. Thank you, Kathy, and thanks everybody for joining again. And so if you tuned in to kind of part one, um, I'm sure you're gonna wanna hear more from this guest. Um, so you can you can get kind of all of our podcasts wherever you find podcasts, but today we have uh, with us our Chief Medical Officer at Spectrum Engineering and Recovery Center, Dr. Jeffrey Baxter. Um, and today, you know, we talked in our part one about our COVID response and what are the COVID needs of individuals for addiction treatment and how has the field and spectrum and doing on our recovery center adapted um, to that. But really, you know, being innovative with COVID is one of the only, it was one of the, one of the ways in which um, we are innovative. And so I, what we want to spend some time talking about today, Dr. Baxter is, you know, what do we do to kind of really be innovative with meeting the needs and the demand for treatment? How do we provide kind of immediate access, rapid access? You know, what, what are some of the ways that we, uh, we help folks who, who need us? Great. Thank you guys again for having me here. It's an honor to be a part of this. Um, I think Lisa and, and you and Catherine can help me with this, but to really understand how we have um, sort of evolved the access to treatment, people should understand how it used to be for people to get into treatment, right? So the traditional way people would come into treatment would be you might you know, call an organization and get scheduled two or three weeks out with a, a counselor. And then, um, you know, if you needed medication to help stabilize your substance use, it could take weeks to months for your case, you know, to be reviewed and for you to be accepted to treatment. And uh, you and I were just comparing notes about how long ago we, we started this sort of work. But, you know, more than 10 years ago, the spectrum really blew up that old model that that made people jump through multiple hoops in order to come into treatment. And so our goal is treatment on demand the day that you ask for it. And excuse me one second. When we're Please. talking about treatment, we're talking about outpatient treatment. Outpatient treatment. This is not how we would classify getting inpatient. Different category. Uh, you know, it really it really applies to both. But you're right, we should split it up a little bit and talk about outpatient and inpatient. But there are, there are two ways that we sort of blew up the old model. So we wanted people to be able to walk in and start treatment when they were ready so that there weren't multiple calls and long waits. But we also wanted to prioritize people having access to medications. And that's something that was very innovative too, even a decade ago, um, to say that people should have the opportunity to start medications first. Um, because what we know now is that those medications that stabilize people's use is really the, the thing that helps them engage in all kinds of treatment and stay in treatment early on. You know, if people have to wait and go through multiple appointments while they don't feel well or they're sick or they're still using, they're much more likely to drop out. And yet the traditional models used to have people you know, there might have been a requirement to keep three or four appointments with a counselor before you'd even be considered for medications to help you, you know, enter recovery. So we wanted to blow up both of those things. So we came up with a system called same day access, where people would be able to walk in and start treatment, meet a counselor, meet a provider, a medical provider, um, and start both clinical care and, and medicine, medical care uh, on the very same day. And so um, the thing go ahead, about that, okay, that really strike me is, um, 
it, it's so much of a better fit for for who's walking into treatment, who needs treatment, right? So, um, you know, we we all know that um, life and addiction can be very chaotic, and and not very routine. And schedules, you know, making appointments, these are not things that somebody with active addiction can manage. Yet the system before, right? I love how we're framing it, kind of how it used to be, and how we've kind of blown that up, and how it is now, and how it should be really doesn't make you do any of that. You just have to show up on the day that you're ready um, and we'll take care of the rest, you know, versus keeping multiple appointments at set times and really shifts that focus from what kind of the perception used to be in addiction treatment, right? If you really want it, then you'll prove to us that you can um, that you can make it to multiple appointments, and then we'll consider medication, or then we'll consider an admission. Um, and really having to have people whose lives are very chaotic and very upended with with addiction, you know, prove that they want it bad enough um, instead of stabilizing people with medications that we know are going to make them feel so much better, so that they can take part in the rest of it. Yeah, exactly. And and also to add to those great points is it's really kind of elitist. Too, to think that the, the criteria people should meet in order to be eligible for treatment mm. would be to keep a schedule and keep multiple appointments. And, you know, I mean, that takes a, a level of organization and, and education and literacy and resources that a lot of our patients simply don't have. So, you know, we really looked on this walk-in access as a very patient-centered, um, open and welcoming approach, you know, that you didn't have to have a, a college degree and be literate in order to access treatment. We wanted to be open and available for all comers. Which which begs me to ask the question about sort of this, you would know better, both you and Lisa, but the psyche of the patient when they finally hits that, like, today's the day I'm going to do it. And then if they miss that little window of enough is enough, I can't do it anymore. What am I going to do? Then what? Then we might be losing opportunities to help people. It's so true. Catch them when they're ready. And, and, you know, I have to be honest that the inpatient units, we do absolutely offer treatment uh, access every single day. And if for some reason there's no bed available, I mean, we stretch and, and if, there's no bed available in the moment. We call people back within a couple of hours and usually something opens up within 24 hours. So I don't wanna misrepresent. It's not like there's you know immediate access 24 seven, but it's pretty good. Pretty close, yeah. I agree, I agree. And, yeah. and, and with outpatient treatment, you know, we've set up between, depending on how big the program is and how much demand there is, between one to three days a week where the word gets out in the community, when you're ready, you can show up on that day and you can get admitted and start medication for treatment. So again, it, it'd be great if it could be seven days a week. That's not so practical. But here in Worcester, for example, at our largest site, you know, we're offering two to three days a week of walk-in access where you can start medications and start a clinical relationship with a counselor on the very same day. Catch them when they're ready. That's yeah, what you I love do. That. because yeah. You're, otherwise, I mean, otherwise you're losing that window of opportunity. I, I know as a recovering person, when you're ready, you're ready and you've got to act on it because it's so easy. You know, I'm not going to drink today. I'm not going to drink today. And then four o'clock. Well, what was I thinking at eight o'clock this morning? Of course, I'm going to drink today. I feel great. You know, same thing. I'm sure in a different way for addicts or addiction to medication versus uh, alcohol. So Lisa, well, yeah. Did you want, so Lisa, I was just going to add that it kind of goes along with a, a, a updated understanding of how people access recovery. So I think part of that old model was that there was this assumption that patients had to reach, you know, quote unquote, reach their bottom, mm. that people had to really bottom out before they would be motivated and that providers should wait until people hit that mm. bottom and, and uh, fortunately, we've come to the realization that there's tons of benefit to patients to catching them before they get that desperate and, and that sick, right? Mm -hmm. And and even if they don't stay in treatment for more than a couple months, that's a couple months that they had, you know, connected to a system that wants to care for them um, that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And so there's benefit 
to catching people earlier before they have severe consequences to their substance use um, and, and to give it, get an opportunity to build their motivation, right? Like to give us a little credit that just by meeting people and engaging with them, maybe we'll talk them into it or maybe we'll talk them into staying longer than they would have otherwise. And I always say that when I have the opportunity, just give it a shot, get your family member there, let the professionals meaning you, the Lisa's, the Dr. Baxter's, the, let the professionals do their job. You don't have to convince them of anything other than potentially you don't have to take the elevator all the way down. You can get off right now and have a great life. Yeah. And, and I've had so many people come back to me and, you know, people, people go through multiple trials before they, you know, attain sustained recovery and sustained sobriety. But universally, they'll come back and say, you know, I was here, I was drug or alcohol free for a few months, and I loved it. It yeah. felt great. And they remember those good months. And, and even when they, they get it back out into the old routines, you know, it helps them question, it helps them have confidence that their lives could be different, because they remember that one month or they remember that three months where they were drug free last year. And they're like, okay, wait, I know where to go to get back there. And I think that's another thing that we've shifted, right? So there, there has been a history in addiction treatment that if you, you know, drop out of treatment or quote unquote, and I don't like to use this language, fail at a treatment attempt, that you need to kind of wait some determined period of time before you can try again, right? And that's another thing with kind of that the same day kind of rapid access that we've kind of turned turned over to say, you know what, if you if you left for whatever reason, we want you back. Like because we're open, we're, we're available, just come right back and we'll take care of you and we can try this again. And it doesn't matter how many times we have to do that. Um, we're going to be here and ready for you um, that because every treatment attempt gets you closer and closer to that uh, sustained recovery. Absolutely. You know, it's, I think it's an overall recognition um, that it takes more than one try to accomplish something so important and so life-changing as sustained recovery. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think our patients too, you know, get these impressions from their families and from, you know, television and movies that, you know, they'll just get it on the first try. If they're truly ready when they, they try recovery for the first time, you know, they'll have that lightning bolt sort of moment and their lives will change forever. And I'm like, that's really not how long-term, you know, sort of life mm -hmm. changes happen. It's a great, it's like learning your learning curve, right? Like you, you try it out for a month or two and you realize some things went well and some things not so well. And so you come back in and what should we, what should we add to that? You know, to help you stay four months this time instead of two or six months and patients end up surprising themselves and you know hitting longer periods of sobriety than they expected or you know even if they slip or use they suddenly find themselves with the skills and experience to turn it around real quickly you know and jump back into a sustained recovery without having to hit bottom again you know I go through that, that yeah. low low I wish there were more statistics out there or more, uh, not movies, because, but more information given to the community at large that, hey, it's not a one and done. It can be, and that's the rarity. The fact is that it does, it does have a learning curve. I love that language because it's so true. It's a learning curve. It's a whole new muscle. The easy thing to do is to use medication or uh, a drug to make yourself feel better. The hard thing to to, to change everything about yourself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty right. much. You know, and and in medicine too, these sorts of lessons have been applied to other sorts of conditions that are affected by behavior. So you know, compare it to let's say people who are working to lose weight. You know. It takes a lot of time. It does not happen in a lightning bolt sort of moment. We have to relearn how to eat and how to feel, you know, and how to shop and how to socialize, right? With our friends, you know, maybe we shouldn't socialize over two large pizzas and, you know, all that stuff, right? Or type two diabetes or high blood pressure. So it's been great to watch, you know, now that I'm getting older and I've been in medicine for, 20, 25 years to see the models switch to this understanding that 
you know, changing behaviors in a lot of aspects of our lives really is a, a gradual process that, that requires work and attention over time. And it requires um, a reduction of the stigma associated with that, right? Like whenever there's a behavioral component to, you know, to a to a problem, and I think addiction is the top one. There's often a stigma. Well, if you could just stop that, you know, instead of recognizing it's a chronic disease that impacts your brain long term and all of the things that contribute to addiction, um, that that it's that it's a normal course, right, for it to, you know, to to have a, a you know return to use, you know, periods of abstinence or return to use that that is a typical course for addiction um, and being in, in programs like this being readily available to get people back connected with care support just reducing the amount of time um, in that kind of, you know, relapse remitting course. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I, I, th go, go I was just going to add that. So to, to bring this back around to where the conversation started. So our treatment access models really you know, occasionally all the spots are filled, but really we, we don't want people to be embarrassed about dropping out and coming back. We want you back. Um, you know, you have to, it's pretty dire circumstances if you're ever not invited back. <laughs> um, that doesn't happen very often. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we understand that, that people, you know, need to try it out. You got to try recovery on, see how it feels you know, and then try it on again and, you know, get more comfortable in it. And then, you know, eventually it'll become, you know, that'll become your new normal. So, you know, people cycle in and out of our um, buprenorphine, our office-based buprenorphine programs. They cycle uh, in and out of our methadone programs, our inpatient programs. And the team is always trying to just meet people where they are and say, what can we add? What can we do again? Or what can we do differently that's going to help you wear this jacket, this recovery coat longer, you know, and get more comfortable in it. So that's a great introduction to kind of where I was about to head next. And that is, um, you know, one of our newer programs, um, and that's our rapid access to buprenorphine. Um, so can, can you talk a little bit about um, that program and, and how that works and, you know, who, who we can see, you know, what, what, is the, what is the typical kind of referral opportunities there? Yeah, so... We were very fortunate to receive some support from the State Department of Public Health to open up uh, an office, so separate from the methadone programs, but an outpatient office where people could come and get the same sort of walk-in rapid access to uh, the other medications besides methadone that are approved to treat opioid use disorder. So buprenorphine being one of them with the name brand Suboxone, and then now Trexone, which also has a name brand version called uh, Vivitrol. Um, and, and so this was something that we were really wanted to do, right? Because we had seen the success of walk-in, you know, same day access for methadone. And we knew that there was demand out there for other treatments. Not everybody's not right for one treatment, right? One size doesn't fit all. So, you know, the more variety we can offer so people can try on different coats and see which one feels best, you know, which one fits best. Um, you know, even someone who did well in one treatment at one point, you know, might at a different point in their life need a different kind of treatment. So um, fantastic opportunity. We're about two years in now. Uh, we have an office located on Pleasant Street in Worcester, and people are able to come in and uh, be assessed and see a medical provider and meet a clinician and start that very same day on buprenorphine or naltrexone treatment, as long as there's no medical contraindication to help them get stabilized right away. That's great. What, what I hear in that is also compassion. What I heard you describing before is just compassion. Well, you're welcome. We always want you. If you stumble, that's okay. We can switch it up. Maybe one is inappropriate and it's not working for you. Don't give up work with us to let us help find the key for you, not everyone, but for you, the individual. Right. So I do think there's a conception out there in, in our broader society that there's one perfect treatment, you know, that magic bullet and everybody, if they just found that magic treatment, you know, their way to it or committed to it, that it would work. And that's not really true in any field of medicine, right? There are multiple different kinds of blood pressure medicines and diabetes medicines and 
and one doesn't necessarily work for the other person, right? Or we, we change those things all the time to try and meet people where they are. And, and we're fortunate to be able to offer the same for uh, people with opioid use disorders or alcohol yeah. use disorders, right? Like, you, you know, at some point in your life, you might have a job that doesn't allow you to go to the methadone program every day. And you want to try something that's more, you know, flexible based in an office like buprenorphine. At another time, your condition might get so out of control, you really need some patients have said this to me, I need to be accountable to someone every day, I need to show up every day, yeah, and have someone know and care if I didn't show up that day. Right. right? And so that's someone I'm like, I say, well, the, this, have I got a program for you, you know, that's a perfect candidate for the methadone program. Yeah. So, and, and we can switch people in between now, which is great. So if, if they mature and evolve out of one and their, their needs change, or if they're not stable on one and their needs change, we can switch between the modalities now um, between our sites, which is really great to be able to offer. I think like even going back to, I loved your analogy of kind of trying on a coat for recovery. Like if they grew out of that coat, right. And they're ready to mm -hmm. try another one, or, you know, maybe that one's gotten a little, a little too tight and they need something a little bigger, or then they find it's not a good fit, right. It's not keeping them warm enough. So they need to do something a little bit yeah. different and, and go in the other direction, you know, and, and in the, these rapid access models really allow people to do that, right? You don't have to jump through multiple hoops. You don't have to, you know, not do well in one area before you say, you know what, I think I need a shift. I think I need a change. And so we can very quickly help people kind of access what might be right for them today, which might not be what's right for them next month or in six months. You know, the hub, we call it the hub, you know, H-U-B, like it's like a transportation hub where you can go when you, you need to get other places, um, has also allowed us to link up with other providers that are trying to help people in the moment. So one of the reasons DPH wanted to support the model is that they had required emergency departments to start people on buprenorphine. It, you know, if they came in after an overdose or something like that, and the emergency department said, well, that's fine, but then we have no place to send them. And so we accept people into our uh, hub office program out of emergency departments, out of hospitals, out of jails and prisons who have been started and stabilized on medication, but would have lost that treatment on release if there weren't a single place where they could go and we just offer to them, we'll take care of you as long as you need in a transitional basis. We're not going to force you to stay here. We're not going to try to keep you if you don't want to. But our recovery support navigator will help you find treatment closer to home. And so, you know, we've had people come from over an hour away and, and they say, look, you know, being able to get the treatment, even if I needed to come in once a week, is so much better to drive this hour each way than to not have a place to go. And, and some of those people honestly end up staying with us, right? Um, but our, part of our work at the hub is to make sure people have a place where they can go immediately so they don't lose treatment um, and then help them get established closer to home where treatment would be more convenient for them. And that just, that's a great example of, there's lots of barriers, right? Transportation can be one of them or it can't be, but probably the biggest barrier to addiction treatment is access. So if we can eliminate the biggest challenge and barrier of immediate access when you need it, either as a transition from one place to another or just as an entry point into care, that's the biggest barrier. And then we work with identifying ways to address the other barriers, right? Maybe that's going to not be sustainable after, after a month to drive the hour. So in that meantime, you'll be stabilized and we'll help you find something closer to home. I mean, we've have even had people come to us who had appointments set up, but they couldn't get a first appointment for four weeks or six weeks. And we just say, fine, we'll, we'll, we'll take interim. care of it. We'll be, yeah. we're happy to be your interim. And, and, you know, kudos to the Department of Public Health for recognizing that that was needed. And there are other models through the state, some of the hospitals, um, particularly in Boston, have set up what they call bridge clinics so that mm. people they start and stabilize in their hospital setting can step down to the bridge clinic while they try to find something closer to home. And so that's a role we're playing here in central Massachusetts. Well, I think also it speaks to the fact that, you know, sort of if you think of it as a hub, then you can also think of all the spokes and Spectrum, from my point of view, has a lot of good spokes. And where there are spokes missing, 
I love that little analogy. Like, for example, Western Mass. You can be assured that Spectrum is looking into where do we need to make sure people are having access to treatment because as a provider in the state, we want to provide help for everybody, not just, we're not just Worcester Central Mass. Like, that's the beautiful thing. Maybe that's where the quickest rapid access, but the fact that you can push them out to something closer to home that could remain Spectrum, could be other facilities, but for the sake of sort of just spectrum sake, I think it's just remarkable that we're doing the work to find out where do we need to be to help the most people. Yeah, I don't think you can overstate the, the challenges faced by people in rural communities. I mean, urban urban populations have their their challenges as well, but you know, you don't have to get too far out of 95 and 495 to, to really, you can't, there's so little you can do without a car. You know, yeah. there's so little, there, there are much fewer uh, resources, so. Which doesn't mean that addiction isn't a problem. Right. You can find, you can find illegal substances. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, right. Well, the drug dealers all have cars. That's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> they deliver. Yeah, exactly. So, Dr. Baxter, I think that's a really good segue into kind of another area that you've had a lot to do with at, at Spectrum of providing access where people need it. So to Kathy's point about where there might be communities that need it. So when you started at Spectrum, I can remember we had uh, four outpatient sites, right? right. And, and now we have 15. Um, right. and, and that's been a big piece of just re recognition that, you know, in order to help as many people as possible, we need to be in the communities where there's gaps, right? Where there's not enough access to treatment. Can you can you talk a little bit about um, that process of kind of opening up new programs and, you know, meeting people, you know, in new communities? So um, I think the most instructive sort of example is, is when we um, tried to step up to meet treatment needs in Western Mass. Um, you know, there's a lot of politics involved in, in trying to help people who are stigmatized and ostracized. And so, you know, Spectrum really had to go to bat, you know, Pitt, Pittsfield in particular was an area where um, people were traveling over an hour to Springfield every single day to get medication support. Um, and, you know, Pitt, uh, Spectrum offered to, to go in and open a program and identify a site. And you know, a lot of the city leaders really weren't very supportive. And um, it took three years to get that site open. We were told it wasn't needed. We were told it didn't need to go into the area where we, we thought it should go, uh, you know, near the downtown transportation hub, the bus station. Um, and once we finally got it opened, um, it had 100 people on the first month. It had 300 people at the end of the first year. Um, and you know now runs a census of 650 to 700, um, and and literally the uh, mayor of of a town north of there called North Adams, which was much more progressive, actually came to Spectrum and said, "We need you up here. Will you come and open a program up there?" So uh -huh. we were actually expanded within a few years and opened a site there, which now carries about you know 250 to 300 people. Um, and we've just recently expanded to Great Barrington. Again, just trying to, they call it out there, you know, Pittsfield and they call it North County and South County, the areas around Berkshire County that, um, you know, are, are a little further out from the county seat. Um, and, and you really need to just be in the communities that, that people live in, in order to really reach them. You know, if treatment starts to require that you drive, you know, a half hour to 45 minutes each way, you just can't do that and hold a job. Take care of your family. And so I think it's been it great work. Mission, yeah. right? So um, I, I can just, I also personal, personally know that in order to, to open up those programs and provide the care, you yourself drove the two hours um, from, from the area that you live on a, on a you know, weekly, biweekly you know, basis to open that up, right? So I think that, you know, yourself, Spectrum as an organization, it's not, we make it look easy, but it's not, right? It's very mission driven to create these new programs, to open them up, to, to face the political challenges and, and be really committed. To, to meeting addiction treatment needs kind of wherever they sit. Yeah, so we have a, such a fantastic team out. We, we call that the West Coast 
Berkshire County. <laughs> um, but uh, we have a fantastic team, fantastic leadership. Um, we did not have a physician, you know, and, and wow. every program needs a physician. And so, yeah, I was traveling from, from Worcester once a week to support the opening of those programs for quite a while. We have a fantastic physician out there now who's whole, you know leading all of those sites. But um, yeah, you got to have all the pieces. So uh, when we yeah. talk about, you know, podcasts and things like that, you'll get to learn about all the podcasts I listen to while I made that two hour drive each way every week. <laughs> well, what I think of is just wait until COVID is over. People will be clamoring to drive out there. It's the most yeah. part of Oh, no, I love Western Mass. I do. I love yeah. it, too. And it's like, what a great area. It's like, OK, but like for now, it's like you're, it's not like you're going out to Tanglewood and shopping. I mean, for now, it's all business. But I, I yeah. think. You know, well, what a and, lovely and, place to be. And it's so interesting to think about Western Mass as a model for what communities that are um, like really resort communities and what they deal with, you know, the, the year round population, you know, has so many unmet needs. And, you know, it's right. similar on the Cape and it's similar in Martha's Vineyard, uh, you know, in places like that. And I think of Western Mass as a resort destination. We used to always, right. yeah. you know, go before kids, we'd go out there all the time, right? Um, yeah. But people a, come out of the city. And yeah, so, you know, it's, a, it's a destination. I agree. Yeah. But there's a whole core population of, of year round, you know, people that have a lot of needs that go unmet when everything is focused just on your resort populations. So. Uh -huh. That's great. Okay. Um, so let's see. Let's let's just uh, shift gears a, a bit to to talk about inpatient too. And so, um, you know, you mentioned a, a little bit about the the fact that we do provide as rapid access as we can. You know, as twenty four seven as we can. You know, and and we'll do whatever we can to to provide that access. But one of the other things that I think is a, is a, a great um, connection is is helping people access outpatient medication starting in inpatient. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, why that's important and why that's a great entry point into care? Yeah, it's another opportunity to just talk about how traditionally treatment worked, right? So inpatient care was traditionally, you know, seven days long and involved short-term treatment with medications to stable withdrawal, stabilize withdrawal. And then people would be, you know, released back out to their homes or their communities with no follow-up care as if, you know, they had had a pneumonia and, and gone into the hospital for a week and taken antibiotics and then gotten cured, right, of, of their illness. And so, of course, now we, we understand uh, substance use disorders much more like chronic illnesses that require ongoing support. And, though, you know, leaving programs, inpatient programs, was a, a huge time of risk, of huge risk for overdose and relapse. So many, many years ago, we were fortunate that it was very easy for us if we started medications for people in the inpatient setting to just let them transition right over to our outpatient programs and start medicating in the outpatient programs the very next day after they left the inpatient programs. And, you know, it, fortunately, again, because we offered the whole continuum of treatment that we offered inpatient treatment and we offered outpatient treatment, if patients were going somewhere where we had an outpatient program, it was completely seamless. Um, we were still run into trouble connecting people from our inpatient programs who want to go to areas where we don't have our own programs. Mm -hmm. It's not as seamless, but we, you know, we work the inpatient team works really hard to to make sure people who want to go on in treatment with medication can do so without any interruption. Yeah, it just takes more coordination, right? So it's you know for us, it's a shared electronic health record. So having that information and transitioning right from our inpatient to our outpatient, the nurses are looking at the same thing at inpatient as they're looking at an outpatient. Um, you know, it's a bit easier, and but it requires just a little bit more effort, right? Like a lot of coordination agency to agency. You know, I think, I got to be honest with you, and I don't say this to be contrary. I think where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, like, we were doing this way before we had electronic health records, right? And, and it was just like we decided that that's how it should be, and so we were going to make it happen. But there are still, you know, programs with more traditional approaches, that we'll, we'll call them and say, we started this patient on methadone or buprenorphine, and can you take them into your program? And they'll say, well, no, we can't do an intake on them for another month without acknowledging that what, what's the patient supposed to do for the next month? Like, huh. why not you know, seize the opportunity to help someone engage? So it's gotten a lot better. 
you know, the, the state actually has put a lot of pressure on programs to meet that standard of continuing people who've started in inpatient settings, um, but it's not perfect yet. Hmm. Do you think it's Do you think it's more difficult if it's crossing the uh, the borders or just to some outlier in within the state? Like, for example, if if someone is uh, here and sending going back to Vermont, for example, is it harder? Well, I, actually, most of the work we do is is in state. Um, you know, Vermont's an interesting example because they have, they were, they originated the hub and spoke model. So they really do have a treatment infrastructure and accept people into that. New Hampshire's a whole other story, you know, um, it's much harder. Um, so, uh, but we even have trouble within the state, you know, it's very yeah. regional, right? It depends on the provider. Um, but, you know, at least providers within the state of Massachusetts all face the pr same pressure from the, the licensing agencies, you know, the, the Substance Abuse Services Bureau that, you know, really pushes providers to not let people fall out of treatment. Yeah, I, uh, I love I'll it. Let it happen. Sounds, yeah, what I was just thinking when you're saying that is what I do like is that Spectrum is a model for everything. You don't come to us and automatically get put on a medication. It's like, what is good for you? If abstinence is the path you want to take, we have the clinical to support that. If if it's your life is going to be easier and simpler and you're going to sustain some recovery with medication, then let's talk about which. Like, I love the fact that we, we have so many offerings. We're not really a one-size-fits-all. And I do think other places may be seen as one-size-fits-all. Well, you know, it's not, it's not perfect, you know, far be, far, we're certainly not perfect, right? I never claim to be perfect. Um, but I, I do think that if people are looking for a treatment program, they should really look for one that offers all kinds of treatment, right? That uh, otherwise, you know, like, what do they say about a hammer and a nail? Like, you know, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? Um, you're going to get, like you said, one size fits all and one that jacket doesn't fit you anymore, what are you supposed to do? Right. So I, I do think we have prioritized that, like wanting to be able to offer all modalities to meet people where they are, to change while people change, uh -huh. you know, and, and when their needs change to be able to change with them. People might go from needing intensive inpatient treatment with lots of support to being really super stable just without patient support. Um, and we wanna be able to grow and evolve with them. I like that, yeah. All right, so we're coming up towards the the end of the the time frame that we we typically stick to, and so, um, you know, before I, I turn over to Kathy to kind of ask our our, our wrap up question, um, is there anything that um, we haven't talked about that you would want us to talk about? Anything that um, about kind of our rapid access and meeting people kind of where they're at that that we haven't covered, or have we kind of talked about most of it? Well, I'll I'll put in a plug for the the latest frontier in access which is accessing treatment in corrections when people go to jail and when people go to prison. So there's a lot of movement on that in Massachusetts now. Spectrum was very fortunate to receive the um, contract to open up treatment programs in the State Department of Corrections. And so now our goal is to be able to stabilize anybody who needs it on the way in uh, and on the way out and link them directly to treatment without interruption uh, in the same way that we've been doing from other inpatient settings, right? Like almost considering jails and prisons to be like hospitals or detox units. And it's an opportunity, right? People might be motivated or they might be really sick. And once you start them on medications to help stabilize that, you, you want to be able to continue it without interruption. So that's like, keep your eyes on that one. You know, that where there's a lot of work being done and there are still places around the state of Massachusetts where even if people are stable in treatment and they go to jail, that that treatment gets cut off. Um, it's, a scary thought it's, to think it's of. It's really cruel and unusual, but it yeah. still happens every day. And so we're working every day to eliminate that. That should not ha happen in the United States. It should not happen in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and, and so these programs that have been set up and that we're working on at the state level, and that others are working on at the county level, um, are really making progress to eliminate that. 
And, and a lot of that has to do with how high risk that time is after release as well. So certainly humane care, you know, continuing medications and providing withdrawal management while you're incarcerated is definitely a piece of it. But a big piece of that is um, how high risk a time frame that that release time frame is. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, sure. So I mean, we'll get a little statistical here, right? But almost 15 years ago now, the, the paper that really brought this to everyone's attention was published out of Washington State, which showed that people people in the first two weeks after release from incarceration were at over a hundred times increased risk of dying in the first two weeks after they left incarceration from drug overdose. Okay. So, you know, imagine and not doing anything about any condition that increased your risk of death over two weeks by over 125%. Um, so it was a real call to action. Um, and so some of the programs that have been doing this for a while have been able to show a two thirds reduction in death in the first year after release for patients who've been started and continued on medication, medication of their choice. It, do it doesn't have to be one particular medication, but for people with opioid use disorders who are able to start in while incarcerated and continue after leaving incarceration, you can reduce their risk of death in that year after they leave by over two thirds. That's, That's a wonderful statistic. I don't yeah. think a lot of people know that. And I think a lot of people think, oh, what are we giving uh, people who are incarcerated? And that, like, I think there's a whole, I know speaking for, I'll speak for myself, there's a whole depth of knowledge behind that that you don't even think about. For example, it's not, people aren't becoming drug addicts with, or uh opioid addicted in in incarceration but it could be that as simple as what you're saying that they're getting arrested and then having to withdraw without me i mean it sounds horrible and i think it's what we're doing is amazing uh, i think the statistics part of it i i it's fascinating well you know to me it's really just deciding that their lives matter yes. like you know if you have life-saving treatment and you have a condition that causes you to have a over 100 times risk of dying in in, a, in the weeks you after you leave prison, and you have life saving treatment that reduces that risk by two thirds. Why wouldn't why? you do that? Yeah. And all it takes is saying out loud that that life matters, that that life is worth saving, right? And once we finally do that and say that out loud, all the rest follows. It's just sad that it's taken so long to to say that out loud. Yeah, how long have you been working on that? Well, I've been watching it all happen. I mean, it's still happening where we're we're located here in central Massachusetts, but you know, 20 You're trying. Years, over 20 years we've been noticing that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people leave our treatment, right, but get incarcerated, and we do everything we can to make sure they know they can walk back into us. I think that our yeah. immediate access helps mitigate that a bit, but that's still a challenge, right? You know, that may not be the first thing that somebody's able, willing to do as soon as they're really least and they're at really high high risk. So, you know, making sure that there's no gap, right? That there's a continuation in that treatment um, during that time is really important. And I and I for one am super proud of the work that we're doing to be a really big part of that. Um, and there's the more to be done. There's more to be done. So if people who are listening, you know, want to think about a way or if they have loved ones that are facing that, um, there's absolutely room for advocating at the city level, at the county level, at the state level. No patient should suffer involuntary withdrawal symptoms mm -hmm. and no patient should be denied access to life-saving medications just because they have an opioid use disorder and the stigma within corrections and within society doesn't value their lives. We have to say that their lives matter too, yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. All right, so uh, we're kind of getting to the end of this podcast time. So, so Kathy, do you want do you want to wrap up sure. with our? Uh... It's really been so wonderful to get to know you these past two episodes, Thank and um, I, I love the clinical sort of take on things. And uh, as you know, we sort of we each come at it from a different angle, and I I'm like sort of a recovery person because I'm 
kind of a geek on recovery, but I'd love to know and from a personal level or business level, however you feel comfortable, what your favorite book or podcast, something that really like drives you personally. Um, it's just sort of our little closing question so we can know. The sure, sure. Well, ha- happy to share that. So, you know, I was thinking about it and the, the talking about the drive to Pittsfield is a t- perfect opportunity to talk about it. So I, uh, that I really sustained myself during those drives on audiobooks. Um, you know, my my life is right now with teenagers and this job, it does not leave a lot of time for like sitting on the beach reading. I miss that. Some I aspire to that. <laughs> I will get back there. But discovering audiobooks first through the library, you can get them for free. Um, and then um, you know, I actually purchased a, a audible, you know, sort of membership. And so, you know, my favorite stuff is really sort of sci-fi and in Unfortunately, that's a little dark. And during COVID, I haven't been able to <laughs> do a lot of that. But I, I like a lot of historical fiction. I'm, I'm really fascinated by, to be honest with you, like how people lived before they had grocery stores and um, internal plumbing and, you know, water. And, and so, like, I, you know, I still remember, you know, reading a book called Cold Mountain 25 years ago. And then I, I, I bought it and I listened to it over and over again. And I just find it so fascinating to think how people scratch a living out of the earth. (laughs) Um, I know because honestly, it's, it's wonderful, but I, I honestly, you know, a part of it's a little bit of just realization that, you know, if the grocery stores ever close, I'm going to starve to death. (laughs) That's it. You know, delivering in two hours. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I know. Like, what do you do when there's no door dash? I mean, that's just how dependent I am on society. So yeah, I, so I just, I I do find myself really, you know, loving stories just that kind of help me understand how people (laughs) live before we had all these modern conveniences. Life is so great today, isn't it? We don't have Right. It just reminds me like, like my life could be a lot more difficult than it is, you know? That's the truth. That keeps you in gratitude for sure. Exactly. (laughs) Well, from my point of view, it was such a lovely uh, time having you here. And Lisa, if you want to just say a few words. Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been so fortunate to work, work closely alongside you for all this this time you've been at Spectrum, and, and but I have the suspicion that um, your beach reading time is probably not coming anytime soon <laughs> because you're so mission driven, and you know between the you know meeting the needs and corrections, meeting the needs across the state, that there will be you know more and more ways that you'll help push uh, Spectrum and the organization and the field in general forward, um, and we'll probably keep spending all of your time. So we appreciate it, and hope you can. Bye. I appreciate I appreciate you guys. Thanks for doing what you're doing, and and it's been great to uh, share this conversation. You're welcome, with you. and and if if need be, we're gonna have you as a episode three kind of guy. So hang in there. Just let me know. <laughs> have lots of questions. Let me know if I can be helpful. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks so much. All right. Take care.